<laughs> My name is Joan Regalot. I'm an Edmonton area author for children and adults, as well as a freelance writer, editor, and trainer. I'm delighted to be part of the Writers Guild of Alberta online reading series and introduce you to the author of a novel that is both compelling and insightful. As an adoptee who grew up in the 60s in Atlantic Canada, Diane Palovic was inspired to write In Trouble and bring this hidden part of Canadian history to life for a new generation. She has a Bachelor of Science degree from Acadia University, an education certificate from the University of Alberta, an employment training specialist certificate from the University of San Francisco, and a travel writing certificate from Lakeland College. Diane worked with people with disabilities for more than 20 years and co-authored a training course for human service workers in Alberta. Diane and her husband live in Alberta, and reviewers have shared a number of comments that I'd like to share with you. In Trouble is a powerful story about women finding ways to survive when society has turned its back on them. With empathy and care, Diane Palovic has brought a little known piece of 1960s Halifax back to life. A poignant glimpse into the indelible emotional scarring perpetrated in part by societal condemnation of these unfortunate and vulnerable young women. Emotional and a great main character. Love the end, strong female characters. So lots of great reviews for In Trouble. And now um, let's meet Diane and talk about this wonderful novel that you've written. First of all, can you tell us a bit about yourself? You know, who are you and what inspired you to write this story? Thanks, Joan. And first of all, I'd just like to give a quick thank you to the uh, Writers Guild of Alberta and also to the Rosa Foundation for providing the opportunity for me to share uh, a little bit about myself and a great deal about the book In Trouble. Uh, for myself, I am an avid reader, but I'm a newbie author. And when I was uh, still employed, I told many people around me that when I retired, I was going to uh, move to Salt Spring Island and I was going to write a racy novel. Well, one of those happened. I did retire and I felt that I still wanted to write a book, but it didn't turn out to be a racy novel. I knew nothing about writing, so I decided that I would join online uh, writing courses and uh, become a member of the library uh, writers group in the city where I live. I was very fortunate to have the Writers in Residence program come to our local, uh, local library in 2014. And for many years, those mentors helped me get across the finish line within trouble. And here I am, six years later, <laughs> a published author which was something that I really wanted uh, to do. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier in my introduction, I have a personal connection with this story, with this book. I am an adoptee, and I think that, that has probably prompted some of the motivation to, to complete this book. When there's a personal aspect like that, it's, it's, uh, it's so compelling, and it, it makes the reading so much more interesting knowing that about you. So tell us, what is In Trouble about? Or, or I should say, why, why is the title In Trouble? Let's start with that. Well, In Trouble simply is the euphemism for uh, women who were pregnant and unmarried. And I, that's the first idea I had for the title. And it stayed with me throughout the whole writing of the novel. And even the publisher at the time, last year, uh, when I approached them, they thought that worked too. So it's, it's stuck as In Trouble. And and when you ask about the story, what is the story really about? Um, it's about loss. It's about betrayal. Uh, it's about um, survival. It's based on facts, Canadian facts, and it has fictional created characters. The setting is in Halifax, the year is 1961. And Sarah Gardner, who is the main character, is being uh, taken by her parents and hidden in an unwed mother's home in Halifax. There she has no name, she has no past, and she's expected to give up her baby for adoption. Uh, then return home and forget that anything ever happened to her. But Sarah had another idea. She wanted to keep the baby, and that sets up the conflict that drives the story forward. 
So it's a it's a battle of her her wishes and and the expectations of others. Why don't Why don't you read a bit for us now and and let us meet this character of yours? Let's meet Sarah. Let's meet Sarah. <laughs> This is uh, the first chapter in the first couple of pages of chapter one. Here we meet Sarah Gardner on her way to a home for unwed mothers. Uh, she's on the ferry from Prince Edward Island to New Brunswick. And um, here we go. It's January the 6th, 1961. You're in the Northumberland Strait. Sarah Gardner leaned against the ship's rail. She'd lost all hope and decided to jump. The future she longed for was gone forever, destroyed by those she trusted. I'll jump and I'll make them all feel guilty. Show all those perfect people with holier than thou attitudes. The north wind held across the ship's deck and slapped Sarah's face across her mouth. Stinging spray from the frigid Atlantic gale peppered her face. She took off her glove, eased her hand into her pocket and stroked the leather cover of her diary. It was the only part of Miles she could hold on to. She closed her eyes against the chilling dampness and summoned his face. Her index finger moved over the zipper, its tiny teeth rippling along the tip of her nail. The moment of pleasure was swept aside in an instant. Then her back raced against the deck rail. She pounded the deck floor with her heel, pleading for pain to chase away the summer memories. Even now, he owned her heart. While Sarah fought the blustery weather and her demons, other ferry passengers enjoyed a warm journey and food inside the passenger lounge. Large windows offered watery views without the bitter cold. Sarah's parents sat side by side in silence, removed from the other passengers. There was nothing left to say. They simply needed to commit to complete their commitment. Take Sarah to Rose Hill home and leave her there. No one was convinced that family and friends bought their idea that their only child would be spending the time in Halifax taking an art course. It was true, Sarah was exceptionally talented, but leaving school partway through the year was a dead giveaway. But they had no choice. It was 1961, Sarah was 17, pregnant, and society expected her to be out of sight. Like many others over the years, she was going to a non-wed mother's home. This one was in Halifax. There, she would wait for her baby to be born, give it up for adoption, return home. Bad girl problem solved. For weeks, Sarah had pleaded with her mother not to take her away. She hated the calm, preachy phrases her mother used to defend, the need for her to leave home. Sarah, you're in trouble. You can't stay here. It's best for you. In time, it will be easier and you'll forget everything. Sarah grasped the deck rail with both hands, took a deep breath and exhaled. She placed her left foot on the cross bracing, ready to swing herself up, over and into oblivion. Okay, on three, one, two. But the metal lounge door clanged shut. She turned, a tall, dark haired young man in a navy peak coat strolled toward the railing. As he pulled up his collar, he looked straight at her. But she was in no mood for a conversation and she looked away. Pretty snappy out here. You're experiencing the crossing at its worst. Stinging salt water and a fuel smell. Smell, Whew. got a bet on with somebody inside to see how long you'll stay outside in this. Sarah lifted her head. No, just avoiding them. Ah, I might have chosen to stay in the bathroom instead. He received a snort in response. Going to Halifax for a day or two? No, going for a while. Not my idea. Parents think they know better. Oh yeah, I know what that, that means. My name's Andy and yours is? Sarah, you live in the island? Yeah, she returned her gaze to the water. My office is in Halifax and I travel all over the Maritimes. Just visit my mother on the island. It's great except on cold days like this one. Been in Halifax before? Once. An art show with my parents. Oh, cool. Are you visiting friends? No. My parents think I need to grow up. Sarah wrapped her arms around the slight bulge in her midsection and met Andy's eyes head on. 
And so that's the introduction of Sarah on her way to the unwed mother's home. She's obviously very angry with her parents. She's angry with the world and frustrated about herself. Such an interesting character and an interesting time period and interesting location, like fun for readers to hear about Atlantic Canada and really, I don't, you know, I, I hate to say we're immersed in it because they're on a boat right now, but, you know, to feel that setting and how you, know, you describe it is, is very satisfying. Over here. So, so I'm, I'm very familiar. You know, what surprises, without, you know, without giving away the <laughs> Well, you're familiar with that setting, very familiar. Uh, yeah, I'm very familiar with the Maritimes, so I've, it, it's, it's comforting to me to read the story, even though the, the story itself is quite disturbing. Um, to answer your question about surprises, well, the title in Trouble denotes that it's going to be a lot of anger and frustration and sadness, and that's true. There's a boatload of that in the book. But in the Unwed Mother's Home, I've created an eclectic collection of young women to live with Sarah. And when you get an, an eclectic collection of young women together, all kinds of events happen, antics, um, problems, uh, personalities clash. And in some of those, you're going to find some irony and some hilarity. So there are, there are bits of levity in the story. So that may be the surprise that's, that's there. Having all the different girls in the in the home with her gives gave you a lot of opportunity to to show different experiences or that people that young women had mm -hmm. leading up to being in the home. And for, I found that very interesting. Yes. And it is it is it's one of the things that struck some of the early readers that they really disliked some of the people who were there with her, <laughs> and others were quite lovely. Which is what you want. You want to get a reaction from your readers. And, and that, <laughs> I, that's, I that's, hate I, that person. <laughs> <laughs> so how, this story is set in, in the 60s, but how does it how does it connect with readers today? Well, Why is In yeah. Trouble an important read? Yeah. Well, in the 1940s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, society really expected unwed mothers to be hidden, to be out of sight and to, to take the shame and the blame for the pregnancy that they had. So reading it in 2020 is a whole uh, different world that the reader finds themselves in. And so I think it's a bit of a history lesson. I mean, it is historical fiction and I think it, it is, there is a bit of history uh, for sure. But the other piece that I want to talk about with regard to that is I think that the characters are very relatable uh, in this book, and they're relatable to multiple generations, which gives us an opportunity for people of different generations to communicate uh, about this subject. And I have a little story that I would quickly like to be able to tell about my farmer's market experience with one of the readers of the book. This past summer, I've attended the local farmer's market a few evenings. Uh, one of the evenings that I attended, a young uh, middle-aged woman actually came to my booth and said, so tell me what this story is really all about. And I did. And she opened up to me that this was an issue that they had in their family in years past. And she would like to bring it into today and to talk about the issue uh, with family members uh, in 2020. So she said, I'm going to read this book and see if it helps me. Two weeks later, she rushed up to my booth, her hand flying in the air and saying, it's a wonderful book, it's a wonderful book. So she came to the booth directly in front of me and said, I've, this is a wonderful book. I've read it. Um, discussions have already started in the family about what happened so long ago. And the best news ever is my mother is now reading the book. And so... I think this is this speaks to what the importance of this book is is about in 2020. I think so too, and I think you know our emotions that people had in the 60s are not entirely different from the emotions we have today. The way that society responds is different. <laughs> society, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, that's true. And, and with so many people um, exploring their DNA and finding some family secrets. 
this is the kind of book that offers perspective of why people made the decisions they made or why they, mm -hmm. why they didn't actually get to make their own decisions, why they were um, put in positions where they felt they had no choices. So I think, I think it definitely offers something for readers today. But you had to do a lot of research for this book. Can you tell me about the research? Um, I rather at times fell in love with the research because it's pretty seductive. And what I found out uh, as I went along in the early uh, weeks and months is I was reading more than I was writing. And that, that had to stop real quick. <laughs> but research is beneficial. And it does help you get into that space and that time and understand what went on. I want to just quickly look at um, a statement that is a shocking statistic of that era. And I'm, I'm bringing the paper in front of me because the source is, title is quite lengthy. The one shocking statistic uh, that I found was from uh, the Canadian Senate's uh, 2018 report entitled The Shame is Ours, Forced Adoption of the Babies of Unwed Mothers in Post-War Canada. And the report indicates that between 400 and 500,000 uh, babies were put into forced adoption between the 1940s and the early 70s, 400 and 500,000. It's a stunning number, it's a sobering number, and it was probably one of the most, I won't say gut-wrenching, but one of the real numbers that, that struck me while I was doing my research. It's, it's, it's a sobering number. That's staggering. Yeah, it is. That's staggering. It is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Even the people at the publishers, when they read this, uh, because it's in the, on the cover, the back cover of the book, they said, Really? And I said, I know, I had to put it somewhere in the book. And you can't put it in the dialogue, but you can yeah, put right. it, <laughs> but you can <laughs> sneak it into the cover somewhere in the back That's cover. Right. You can yeah. figure it out somehow. And we did. You have to challenge yourself to find the right way. But, you know, spending all yeah. that time on research clearly paid off for you because the book is rich in detail. And it is. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, it. I know for myself as a writer, after a while, um, research almost can feel like procrastination, but then you get then you get that perfect fact that you need, and you you're okay. <laughs> you can forgive yourself for that you time. Can save, save by research. Research sometimes. That's right. Right. That's right. right. Okay. So um, one more question, and then let's do another reading. Now. I'd like okay. to know where you, where do you get your ideas from? You know, your idea for the book itself, also like within the book, you know, you. Have, it's a whole novel. You had more than one idea. You had to have lots of ideas coming together in different ways, and right. different characters. Aside from it being Canadian historical uh, fiction, which is, is obvious, I really am a, a keener about visiting um, parts of our own country. Many of the places that we've visited over all these years uh, have had events happen in them. And whether or not they do, I still enjoy visiting the location, visiting the museum, writing notes, taking pictures, talking to people, buying things that they've written about whatever the event was that happened in their particular locale. So when I'm at home, how do the ideas come? Well, I've done research and then I collect in my head all of these things that I've been thinking about when I was there because you get ideas and you just quickly take a little notepad and write. I carried one in my bag all the time. So I create what I call a brew uh, of possibilities and then let it kind of stew and effervesce and then, then the storyline comes to me. And when I'm stuck, I just go back to the brew and think about what else could happen here that would enhance the story and make the characters more uh, viable. So that's oh, that's what we do. <laughs> it's like creating a room. I, I think yeah. it's not like you can go in the kitchen and peek in your stock pot and a few ideas <laughs> pour out. And you yeah, I, don't <laughs> I don't know whether brew or stew is the appropriate yeah. word. It's certainly, it's certainly something. Either, it's a combo. Either way, the ideas are fermenting and they come out when you need them. <laughs> Sometimes, but Sometimes. Then there are other times, yes, there are other times. 
So okay. set the stage for us for your okay. next week. What, what are, what's happening just okay. before the part you read? Okay. I, I'm just going to move on to the second chapter, and I don't plan to read a, a, from every chapter tonight, but I'm moving to the second chapter in the book. And in this scene, uh, Sarah is actually being admitted to Rose Hill Home. Sarah and her mother are in the matron's office, and the reading uh, begins with the matron uh, speaking. So uh, finally, Sarah, about your name. Our girls use only first names and they choose them for the time they're with us. So what name would you like to have while you're here? Well, why can't I use my own name? I have a name, how does that help anything? Well, uh, Sarah, you and your mother and your whole family, in fact, are putting this unfortunate event in the past. A new name helps the past disappear. You can become someone else for a while. Okay, so I'll tell you later, right? Oh, I'm afraid not. You must begin your first day here with a clean slate. No past to interfere with the new, inter, interfere with the new life you are beginning. So what will it be? A fond memory of her grandmother Gardner popped into Sarah's head and she blurted, Eva, Eva's what I want. Good. Now you must not tell anyone your real name. You must not tell them their first, your, the first name or your last name. It's expected you will not talk to anybody about your family, where you're from, or any personal, personal details of your life. Do you understand? Sarah stared at Matron and answered with forced certainty. I'm sure. So do you have any questions, Eva? Yes. Who answers my questions about pregnancy? Do I see a doctor? Will my baby be born here? And what do we do here besides chores? Sarah, don't be so snippy. Apologize to Mrs. Andrews. Hmm. Sarah's mother reached out to pat Sarah's arm, but Sarah winced and clenched her fists. So Matron answered quickly, you'll be able to talk about your pregnancy with the caseworker. We have reading material and arts and craft supplies in the sitting room, and a local minister leads a weekly discussion group on Sunday afternoon. Craft supplies and the minister? When can I see this caseworker? Oh, well, in a few days, I'll let you know before she arrives. So unless you have any other questions, it's a good time for you to say goodbye to your mother. We have to discuss a few things after you've gone to your room. I am going to go find someone who is going to help you get settled in. So Sarah is not happy at all. And she turns and walks toward the window. Sarah, I hope you use this time wisely. Think about your future after this is over. You can begin a new life. Also, you better knock that anger out of yourself or life is going to be very hard. Turn around right now. And Sarah did. She spun around. Knock it out of myself? I didn't put it in there in the first place. Why do you think I'm angry? Could it be I can't trust anybody? Could it be nobody will help me? Could it be everybody knows what's best for me but me? Could it be I have no idea what will happen in this prison prison? Now I can't use my own name, wear my own clothes, or use my brain. I don't have a life. How do I start a new one? Tell me that. Wow. So <laughs> what everybody wants to know when there's a historical fiction is what parts are true. And so is it, in fact, um, true that in, in some homes, that you found in your research that they would have to change their names and be very private about their personal information? Yes, that was very common. Uh, the home that I have written about is probably um, softer than many uh, were across our country during those times. And uh, so, but the what your question that you've asked me, yes, uh, it was, Basically, uh, I think an attempt to create privacy for people, for the families, because after all, um, it was an embarrassment. It was a big embarrassment for families to have their daughter um, pregnant and unmarried and in an unwed mother's home. So it was all hush hush. So, so there's all the isolation and 
they're they're foisted into um, a home where you know it's a very strange situation. They can't talk about themselves. You you had an endless fodder for frustrating, you know, for making frustrations in, to move your plot forward. And you had to put yourself into that age, into that 16 year old, that's how old Sarah is, right? 16? Yes. You had to put yourself into that place in your head. Was was that a challenge or how did it feel doing that? Uh, it was a challenge to go back that many years because I'm many decades beyond 16. Uh, but I did grow up in that era and I, lived in that environment where um, n privacy about a lot of things in life were kept to the family, not just about uh, unwed um, mothers. So it, it, it was a challenge, uh, but I enjoyed it. And it was reliving some of my uh, youthful experiences, I guess, and in, in the small village that I grew up in and that location. So it was tough. But, uh, I'm sure it, you know, it had its challenges, but at the same time, that part of the journey is what makes writing so satisfying because you have to challenge yourself to go deep and remember things that you might not have thought about, just about, you know, the way people lived and the attitudes and the no Sunday shopping. Those, those kind of details that, that some people would find so surprising and some of us remember. <laughs> and uh, that's been, that sort of thing has been discussed with me many times by people who've read the book who are of my age or maybe a bit younger. Uh, and uh, it brought them, took them back to, to the time when things happened in their community that they were not privy to. Yeah, it's, a, it's a fascinating look back. How long did it take to write In Trouble? <laughs> Too long. <laughs> longer than you thought. Longer than I thought. Um, it took me six years from the time that I actually started knowing very little about how to write a book until it was published in January of, of this year. Uh, I've, I've speeded up the process a little bit because I'm working on a second one now and I have an idea for a third. So I can't take six years to do novel number two. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to those um, those future works a little later, but you know, I don't think it's not uncommon to to spend a long time writing a, a book, and especially a novel of this length. You have multiple characters and perspectives. You've got research. You're learning the craft of writing and perfecting it, and getting feedback. So, you know, it, six years might sound quite short to some people. I thought so. <laughs> maybe when you're maybe when you're thirty, but. Uh... Well, and, and authors have different approaches. Like some some people are called are plotters. They'll outline and make notes and have a clear idea of where every chapter is going before they start the actual book. And others are called, I'm sure you've known, pantsers, where you write by the seat of your pants. So, which are you? Are you a plotter or a pantser? I start out um, as a plotter because I, out of the brew, <laughs> create um, a story storyline, story arc with uh, what I hope is well-defined characters. And I'm, I'm usually going along quite nicely until uh, one of the characters uh, sometimes hijack a scene and I'm sent off into um, pantser land because I have to write something by the seat of my pants to work the story out into where it should be going and not take off in this bizarre tangent for for too long so i'm a hybrid um i like to think that i'm a planner but sometimes things bad things <laughs> things happen my current book somebody just got murdered and i wasn't planning to write a murder mystery but i'm <laughs> i'm in the middle of that now so i have to learn about it. <laughs> so you, have, you put your characters in trouble, which is what a writer must do. But then you have the challenge of getting them out, and you have, and that's, that's where maybe you're, you're you're going by the seat of your pants, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure you've had the same experience. Uh, I have. <laughs> yes. yes, I have. So it, you know, this this is a, a, a full length novel you've written, and that takes a lot of time. How did you? commit to the time required to do this you you um, you must have some secrets to share 
Hmm. Well, uh, I can talk about this and I, um, I enjoy uh, writing, but I realized fairly early on that I might be the, the person who is one uh, the 90 some percent of people who don't finish a novel. 100 start, 90 some percent don't finish. And I thought I was heading in, in, in that direction uh, in the first um, a few months. However, I decided that I had to fix this somehow because uh, I was told by a writer uh, mentor that uh, writer's block is all in your mind. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's right, it is. And so what I uh, just did was literally force myself to sit uh, in the chair and keep the keyboard clicking. I was writing about anything and everything, not all of it related to the story that I was creating, but it seemed to work. And what I've come out of that experience with is the conclusion that you have to, if you're going to write successfully and complete the project, you're going to have to sit in that seat until your brain heats up enough to have creative things bubbling away. In, in your mind that you can then write about and edit later, but you can, you know, they keep you going. Well, it sounds like a good approach and it clearly works for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you like to take another, another session for us? Okay, I'm going to uh, skip right through to chapter 19 and read a couple of pages uh, there. This is uh, chapter nine, uh, and in this particular chapter, Sarah is really struggling um, emotionally, socially. She's she's quite distraught. Uh, she wants to keep her baby, and her future is at this point quite unclear. Uh, what I am going to start reading is in a conversation between Sarah and her roommate, Amelia, who is a few years older and uh, is a photographer. So we'll begin uh, with um, Sarah, who has asked uh, Amelia how she copes in the home, and here is Amelia's response. Amelia's soft stone, uh, tone continued, mostly, mostly cope about surviving every day, things that just make days move forward, we all cope in our own way here, you know. Some of us read, some of us eat a lot, some of us annoy others. You sketch. So so what's happening tonight? Oh, I don't I don't know what to do. I need help. And Sarah covered her face with both of her hands. Something in particular tonight? Oh no, it's everything. I can't even think straight. My head's everywhere, and she twirled her index finger in midair. Well, I'm like that sometimes. I feel out of control by all that's going on in my head and around me. It sounds familiar to me. Yeah, I know. But the more I think about everything, the worse it gets. And when does this all end? Honestly, I haven't a clue, Sarah. As I said, I still have awful days. For me, I still have to take each day as it comes. Well, that's really easy for you to say. You've got everything. You've got a job, you've somewhere to go, you have future waiting for you. Sarah let a deep sigh followed, up, followed by a long pause, and her voice softened to a whisper. Sorry, sorry, that was a mean thing to say. And she looked around the room. There's no future for me or for my baby anymore. And she looked to the ceiling, eyes searching for an answer. And Amelia then began slowly again and gently. But you do have a future. But it's not the one that you dreamed about with Miles. It's going to be the one you bring to life, not the one that society dictates. Your art will give you strength to manage the difficult times, just as it has here. When your survival skills kick in, planning will begin. I, I know. I know, it sounds easy, but it's hard work, hard work every day. But how do I begin? Well, didn't you have dreams, ideas about your future before Miles? 
Yes, some of them are probably really dumb. Maybe, but that doesn't matter at the moment. Could you start to think about one tonight? Right this minute? No. And Sarah wrapped her arms around her stomach. How can you stay so calm? You don't remember the basket case that was me who arrived last week? I have to work at it every day. I tell myself there'll be bad days and then I must move on. Can you tell me what happened to that angry man? Well, he died in a car crash. I'm relieved, my fear is over, but he left me with scars that can't be seen and some will never fade away. And still I have fears and I have fears about my future. Fears, but the nutter's gone. You can leave here and go back to your life. A work life, yes, but my fears are people fears. Their questions, their looks, their assumptions. About what? Well, my co-workers think I'm visiting my family in England right now. Well, why is that a problem? Amelia thought about revealing more, but she chose to remain silent. Hmm. Well, I'll have to make up lots of stories about people and places I didn't see. She immediately felt guilty, but it was the best answer for the moment. Can I ask what you will do when you leave? Well, I'm a photographer, as you probably figured out days ago, and I understand my return to the outside world will be different than yours, but it will be not be easy for either of us. Sarah managed a fleeting smile, but held back the question that she'd agonized over for so, so long. An unthinkable question. She tried to hide from herself and dared not speak out loud. Once uttered, it would become real. The dreadful words would demand an answer. She glanced at Amelia, who was clearly waiting for her to say something. I know. So then Amelia took Sarah's hand and says, you're upset and afraid. Talk to me. Sarah suddenly felt aching heaviness as a pain spread across her chest and she closed her eyes. Breathe, Sarah, breathe slowly. Breathe again, good. Breathe again, good. You okay? Yeah, I'm better. And then a whisper. What about my baby? She moved her hands in slow circles over her stomach. I love my baby. What's wrong with me loving and keeping my baby? A pause and a slow deep breath. Why can't my parents love my baby? And she lifted her head. Am I a bad person? A very powerful choice for a reading. Young people counseling young people when the in a sense when some of the adults let them down you might say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're living it together and they only have each other there uh, so so sometimes having a roommate is a good thing <laughs> it sure is <laughs> I wanted their own room but they you know <laughs> this turned out to be okay in, in that way. So tell us, what, what do you want readers to remember about In Trouble? I, I struggled with that um, thought after it's been written. And I, I've come to the conclusion that there are probably two or three things that I would like people to remember. Um, I would like people to connect to remember the people that they read about. And while they are fictional, they are representational of a lot of young women who in those early years uh, lived Sarah's uh, life. So the, the emotional con connection to relatable uh, characters. I think that I would like the readers also to remember that this might be or to recall that this might be a new experience for them they are reading about a time that is not now but they may uh, connect with the characters and have a sense 
of what was in the past, a dilemma that they didn't themselves in, endure or may know someone who has, but they're, they're experiencing as a reader a new dilemma. I think that it's temp it's definitely an empathy building book and you know that you succeeded in what you set out to do, which was to share um, a difficult situation that an enormous number of people faced and and do it using a storytelling format that is engaging and entertaining at the same time, but reveals important truths. So now you have now you have to follow this with something else. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna what's your next book going to be about? Uh, well, briefly describing it, it it's happen, it's happening and begins in 1895. And uh, we have a newlywed um, by the name of Margaret Bell, who's just discovered that she's married an abusive man and he may be a murderer. Uh, she, <laughs> that's how the murder popped in. And <laughs> I, I'm going to, this story will take probably 15 years uh, in, in telling. And she, through that period of time, has suffered a great deal of loneliness. And it's only when in the end or near the end of the story, there's a huge explosion that happens and it uncovers many truths for many people in the story. So that's as so smart as like, I am. It's like you did some plotting this time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm I'm going to be fascinated to follow your career and learn more about what you're writing. So tell us where can people purchase in trouble? Oh, absolutely. I've created a little um, bit of information that people can hopefully uh, read on the screen. Pardon? A little bit closer would be good. Like you can okay. see the screen. We okay. can see now the Facebook link okay. there. So, so it's available. Uh, yeah, it's available in soft cover at Amazon, eBooks, Kobo, Kindle, and uh, iBook and Apple. Uh, I would also like to have a, a make a plug for local um, bookstores, people's local bookstores to shop local. The book can be ordered at your local bookstore and they will bring it in for you. So if Amazon is not a choice for you and you'd rather shop locally at your local bookstore, then you can certainly do that too. And, and if people want, to follow me, people want to follow me, I'm on Facebook, Diane Palovic, author. Well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for answering all these questions and sharing your work with us and the, the wonderful readings that were so engaging to hear. I think um, that you're definitely an author to follow and I, I hope that um, you continue to write and each project will, you know, take different lengths of time, but it's, it's so satisfying to see that book come together and have the opportunity to hear the words from the author's mouth, to hear you read the story yourself. It's, it's powerful. You've we've definitely got the gift for words. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate it.